Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Arts to Mom podcast. I'm Lauren Rose, and today we have a licensed mental health counselor here, Natasha D'Arcangelo. She is a certified clinical trauma professional and a certified compassion fatigue professional. So let's start at the beginning sure. um, when we talk about therapy. How do I know if I need therapy? Well, I feel like right now the rule is if you are alive on the planet, you probably need <laughs> therapy. Um, we have been through and honestly are still um, suffering from the effects of a global traumatic event um, mm -hmm. in the form of COVID. And um, I know for a, for some people, it feels like life has gone back to, I'm going to use air quotes, normal. Um, mm -hmm. However, we're, we're not back to pre-COVID universe. Uh, we've lost folks. It has fundamentally changed the way that we work, that we interact with people. And so we're still seeing the after effects of that. Um, people that have children can see that there has been a huge, huge disruption in their education, mm -hmm. in their development, in the social aspects of their lives, right? So we're still undergoing the effects of that. And so honestly, I feel like everybody needs to be in therapy <laughs> right now. Um, but, you know, outside of that, then I would say a couple of the, the really big signs are, I always check with clients of, um, have you changed your sleeping habits? So sometimes people have no problem sleeping. It's, you know, never an issue, but then all of a sudden they're laying in bed and they're staring at the ceiling for an hour or two and they can't fall asleep. Or maybe you're able to fall asleep, but then you're struggling to be able to stay asleep and you're getting up just constantly throughout the night without, uh, without a newborn or a baby to blame on that. Um, and then you're waking up in the morning, not feeling rested at all. Or sometimes people will go to the other end of the spectrum and they will sleep a lot uh, as a coping skill to try to avoid what's going on. And so sometimes folks will sleep for, you know, sometimes I've, I've had clients who'll sleep 12, 14 hours a day. And again, waking up, not feeling rested, but it's a way for them to escape what's going on in their lives. Although while you're asleep, things don't magically fix themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So sleep is a really, really good indicator of whether or not something's going on with your mental health. Another big one is a change in appetite. So I work with a lot of clients who struggle with anxiety and a lot of times with anxiety, people will tell me it feels like there's this knot in their stomach and it just the, just the thought of food, they can't even think about putting anything in their bodies. Um, so change in appetite is a big thing. If you're, if you're re realizing, you know, it's, it's seven o'clock at night and I feel like I might have had a granola bar this morning, but I haven't eaten anything else today. So sometimes it's not having those hunger cues uh, is your body's way of telling you that there's something going on. Um, and then again, other end of the spectrum, sometimes mm -hmm. folks will tell me that they're, um, they're eating too much, right? They're using food as a coping skill. And so they're just kind of mindlessly eating. And before they realize it, um, you know, they're, they're down like a half gallon of ice cream, right? Mm -hmm. So that's another really big indicator, especially if you have mm -hmm. unintentionally, um, you know, gained or lost some mm -hmm. weight because of a significant change in appetite. Um, uh, and then I would say like another big one is if you notice a change in your concentration and not just at work, but also for things that you want to do, things that you're choosing to do. So, you know, maybe there's like a TV show or a book that you're really into and you have had to restart this TV show, you know, five times because you're just not paying attention or you've been staring at the same page in a book for half an hour, right? Um, those are also signs that there's something going on. I kind of equate it to when the, you know, the little oil change light comes on on your dashboard, you know, it's your mm -hmm. car's way of telling you, hey, there's something going on. You need to pay attention to this before it gets worse. So those are some of the cues that our bodies will send us. Um, also, sometimes the people around you will notice things and say, hey, you know, you seem to be really sad lately, or you seem to be kind of irritable. It's, you know, mm -hmm. you're like snapping at a lot of people or, 
I don't remember the last time that we were able to, you know, go out to dinner and catch up with each other. You've turned down the last five of my invitations, right? Um, so if people around you are telling you those things and noticing those things, it's probably time to pay attention to them. Yeah. No, those are great. Um, I'm in my fifth or sixth round of therapy right now. Um, my first round was um, I had an eating disorder when I was a, a teenager. Mm -hmm. And then in my adult years, I've just chosen to go to therapy, um, usually because I'm having trouble with, with relationships. They're just mm -hmm. stressing me out to the point where I can't even cope. I don't, you know, I had to learn boundaries and coping mechanisms. And then um, now I'm in, in therapy for anxiety Mm -hmm. Um, cause I mean, anxiety was, has been, has just ruled my life the last few years. It's just, it's sure. paralyzing. Yeah. Um, and, and similar to what you do, I'm also in trauma therapy because I didn't process past traumas in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, Most I didn't realize, don't. yeah, I didn't realize they were going to affect me down the road. So they I just do. would would rather, I, I just ignored it and like, okay, it'll just, it'll, it'll be fine. That's in the past. Right. I don't need to worry about it. It's in the past, Yeah, but that's obviously not the case. Not how it works. Unfortunately, I wish, <laughs> I wish that we could just like will it to go away, but that's not how it works. I know. So why can't we just talk to our friends about our issues? Great question. Um, my best friend will tell you that she both loves and hates that I'm a therapist <laughs> because I'll bet. Um, I can't therapize her, right? Uh, she really struggled postpartum and I helped her find a therapist, but I was not able to be her therapist. And the reason for that is because your friends are too close to the situation. Um, mm -hmm. They they are, uh, hopefully you have friends that are going to be on your side, right? So right. if there's something going on in your relationship or there's something going on with work, you know, they're going to kind of get on the bandwagon and say, yeah, I can't believe your partner would do that. You know, <laughs> they, they yeah. suck so bad and we hate them now. And, um, you know, or yeah, your boss is terrible and we wouldn't work for them either. Uh, so, you know, they're going to get on the bandwagon, which right. it feels good in the moment. And absolutely you mm -hmm. need that validation. Um, the problem is we, we will sometimes, if not often walk away from those conversations with our friends feeling like, okay, well, it was nice to hear that, but I don't really have a resolution. I don't know where I go from here. And so it feels like there's something missing from the conversation. And what's missing is what you would get in therapy. What's missing is um, having an objective third party who is not part of your everyday life weighing in on what's going on and helping you figure out well, what is the problem solving here, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times we will go to our friends and we'll kind of dump everything out, but that's kind of where it stops. The other thing that will oftentimes happen is as humans, we are oftentimes afraid of telling other people what's going on. Even mm -hmm. if you have friends that are fantastic, even if you know they're going to support you and be on your side, it's really normal to hold things back because you are mm -hmm. um, ashamed, right? Maybe you don't want them to know that you're sleeping for 14 hours a day. Um, maybe you don't want them to know that you are having an affair, right? Mm -hmm. And so we will hold things back because we're afraid that other people are going to judge us. That's really normal. But as a result, you're now carrying all this stuff around inside of you with no release valve, and that doesn't feel good. So that's another really big thing that will hold people back is this, you know, shame and then also fear mm -hmm. of judgment. Now, part of my job, and I think part of every therapist's job should be, if I have somebody coming to me, I'm going to call you out on stuff. Now, mm -hmm. I'm going to do that gently, mm -hmm. um, but I am going to call you out on stuff. So say, for example, if I have a client coming to me um, and saying, you know, I'm really struggling with my partner right now. We're just not communicating. I don't know. Maybe this needs to end. I'll probably say something like, well, give me an idea of what happened during your last argument. Like, just kind of give me a rundown. And if I'm hearing things like, oh, well, you know, I told I told him that, that you know, he was the worst thing that ever happened to me and that he's ruining my life and I can't believe how stupid he is. I'm probably going to wow. say something like, you know, 
So you're coming to me because you're telling me that you want to improve your relationship. And can you hear, as you're telling me the story of this last argument, how calling your partner stupid is probably not the best way to like deepen that bond between the two of you. So that's mm -hmm. me calling my client out again, hopefully in a gentler way. Um, but that's, I'm, I'm able to do that because I am an objective third party. Whereas your friends are probably just going to be like, yeah, that's absolutely right. We never liked him and you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So your friends are absolutely fantastic and they should be a part of your support system, but therapy is different. Therapy is hopefully where you feel that there's no judgment. And so you can tell me that you're having an affair. I have worked with plenty of clients that have had affairs. I'm not going to judge you for that. I'm going to help you figure out, well, what do you do with it? Right? Where do you go from here? I'm not here to tell you whether you're doing, like, whether it's right or wrong. That's not for me to say. I'm just here to help you get to a better place emotionally, whatever that looks like for you. So, and, and, Friends, as fantastic as they are, are not always able to do that. Right. And I, I love the fact that you can go into a therapist and say anything and they've heard it before. So, oh, yeah. you know, they're <laughs> yes. a good therapist isn't going to judge you. And, no. and, and you if know, you feel I... judged, don't keep going. You shouldn't feel judged oh, yeah. when you're in your therapist's office. Right. Yeah. N none of my therapists have ever judged me. I don't think I've, right. I've always felt very comfortable. Um, and to your first point of, you know, why you can't just talk to your friends, like I've always known, because I'm very introspective, I know what's wrong with me, I know why it's wrong with me, I just don't know what to do about it. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, absolutely. That's, and that's why I go to therapy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's, let's say that, you know, we decide, I think we do need to try a therapist, maybe. Mm -hmm. Where do we go about finding one? And that could be really overwhelming for a lot of people. Um, I always say the, the easiest place to get started is your employer. So if you work for a large employer, um, major hospital uh, system or a huge corporation, uh, like here, in, I live in Florida, so uh, we have like Publix, for example, right? Or Disney or Universal, so some of our big employers, um, they should have an EAP program, which is an employee assistance program. And what that means is that your employer will pay for you to get a certain number of free therapy sessions, uh, depending on the employer, they're usually between four and six, um, not a hard and fast rule, just a gauge, but, um, you know, that's the best place to get started. That should be part of your benefits package, whatever um, website HR has, that should be easily accessible to you. Typically what you'll do is there's a phone number that you call and they will help you find somebody uh, either local to you if you are wanting to go in person or somebody that is available for telehealth sessions. Uh, you do your free sessions and then you kind of decide where you go from there. One of the questions that I will often get as a follow-up is, well, I don't want to do that because I don't want my employer to know that I'm in therapy. Mm. Um, I am bound by the same HIPAA laws that your doctor is. In fact, we are required to take HIPAA trainings as part of our licensure process, and we have to take those trainings um, as we continue to maintain our license. So your privacy is of the utmost importance. I cannot turn around and say, I'm just going to use Disney as an example, and say to Disney, hey, Disney, just so you know, Jane Smith is now coming to see me once a week. I can't do that. That is a violation of your privacy, and you would have every right to report me to the board if I did that. What we do is we can report numbers. So I can say to Disney, I had uh, 20 employees take advantage of these EAP sessions in the fiscal year of 2022, but I cannot tell them who came to see me. So a lot of times starting with your EAP program is the easiest way to get started. If that doesn't feel comfortable for you still, that's okay. If you have commercial health insurance, uh, Aetna, Cigna, United Health, those kinds of things, then check those websites. Um, they all have a website where you can find participating providers and you can't always find it under mental health. A lot of times they'll have it under behavioral health. So sometimes mm -hmm. folks will get tripped up trying to figure out what to search for. So if you 
search for behavioral health, oftentimes that's when things will come up. So look to find a therapist that is in your zip code, or if you're okay with telehealth, somebody that's licensed in the state in which you live. Those are the two easiest ways to get started. And then mm -hmm. also therapyden.com. So the word therapy, mm -hmm. the word den therapyden.com is a fantastic search engine that can also help you narrow down. Um, there's so many search parameters. So I can find a therapist, let's say that I wanted to see somebody in my area. So that means that they're seeing people in person. Um, I would prefer a female therapist. I would prefer a therapist who works with first generation American clients and a therapist who specializes in anxiety. So I can kind of narrow it down. But, oh, and, and is a network with, um, let's say Cigna, right? I can narrow it down by all of those search parameters on Therapy Den, which is free for you to access. So I really like Therapy Den. Psychology Today is another pretty well known one. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be another option as well for a search engine. Yeah, I know if I've used um, the size EAP. I've done that before. It's great. Um, and I've used, you know, our, our commercial health. I've also used psychology today to, mm -hmm. to, to narrow down because I was looking for somebody who specializes in chronic pain and anxiety. Sure. So that, that was really helpful. Um, yeah. I didn't know about Therapy Den though. So that's. I really good. like Therapy Den. Um, the, the person that started Therapy Den wanted therapists to be able to have um, a, a larger platform to be able to talk about things that they are passionate about. So mm -hmm. um, like social justice work and, and things like that. It took me a couple of hours to set up my Therapy Den profile. Whereas oh, wow. with Psychology Today, they only give you like three paragraphs and you're limited as mm -hmm. to the amount of words that you can use. So so I feel like the mm -hmm. profiles on Therapy Den, you're really getting a much better idea of who that therapist is um, mm -hmm. and really what they specialize in. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. Mm -hmm. So you talked about HIPAA. What mm -hmm. about the information that comes out in therapy? How How does confidentiality work there? Sure. So every single therapist that you ever go see in your first session with them and also in their intake paperwork should have a talk with you about confidentiality. Um, the way that my current position works, I have, it's it's built into the intake paperwork that clients sign before they see me. And then also I always go over it in their first session too. So the speech that you get from your therapist should sound something along the lines of everything that you share with me does remain confidential. There are always a few exceptions to that. Those exceptions being, if I am worried that my client is going to do something to harm themselves or to take their own life, if I am worried that my client is going to do something to harm somebody else or take somebody else's life, if you, my client tells me about child abuse, abuse of an elderly person, or abuse of a disabled adult, I am a state-mandated reporter. I am required to report those things. And then in some instances, uh, a judge's court order or a subpoena can override confidentiality. And then if you are court ordered to treatment, there are going to be limits to confidentiality because some things may need to be reported um, to the judge and or to your parole officer, depending on what your situation is. So those are the, the major exceptions to confidentiality, but otherwise everything should remain confidential between you and your therapist. You're allowed to ask your therapist, how do you keep my, confident, my, my information confidential? What do you use? At this point, most therapists are using some kind of electronic health record. Um, and, you know, like for, because I work fully remotely, my laptop is password protected. And then my electronic health record program is also password protected. So it should be behind um, the rule in therapy is that it should be behind two locked doors, whether that's a physical locked door because um, there are some clinicians that do take notes by hand or whether mm -hmm. it's two locked doors electronically. So, and you're allowed to ask what that looks like. That's a valid question. Interesting. So what can we expect when we when we go to therapy, what does a session look like? Sure. And th this is a question that I feel like a lot of people, therapy is kind of mysterious. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I really like being able to get out and, and hopefully demystify things for folks. Yeah. So what you should expect is your first session 
should be an intake. And I tell clients, I'm going to probably ask you 8 million questions today. Um, but the reason that I'm asking those questions is because I haven't met you before. And so I want to get an idea of what's been going on because that helps me figure out how am I going to best be able to help you? So that first session is probably not going to feel like therapy. It's mm -hmm. going to feel potentially invasive. Um, it's probably going to be uncomfortable. Most folks debate for a long time before they actually pick up the phone and schedule a session to talk to somebody and getting in front of somebody, whether you're in person or telehealth, it's scary. And I get mm -hmm. that right? Um, so take a deep breath, be proud that you made it that far, and prepare yourself that that first session is going to feel kind of business-like. Um, we're going to go over the paperwork. We're going to talk about confidentiality. We're going to talk about my no-show policy. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, uh, payment information. Um, we're we're going to talk about things like that. And then I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I'm going to ask, what brings you to me? I'm going to ask you about your childhood. I'm going to ask you about substance use. I'm going to ask you, um, you know, are are you in a romantic relationship? What does that look like? Um, do you have children? Who's in your support system? Um, you know, th those are only some of the ones coming to mind. I'm going to ask you about suicidal thoughts and any kind of history of self-harm. And so that first session often tends to be more business-like. Sometimes people walk away feeling like, oh, I didn't like that. That's not what I thought therapy was going to be. But that's the intake session. That's the first one. Sometimes people walk away feeling like, Oh, finally, I was able to get some of that off of my chest. And it feels like a little bit of pressure was released. Now, after that first session, uh, and also in that first session, you and your therapist should come up with some kind of treatment plan. That should be a collaborative process between you and your therapist, where the two of you agree, here's what we're going to be working on. Right. And so um, let's say that I've got somebody coming to me in transition and they're miserable at their job, but they don't know if they want to leave because it is a steady income and they do have kids. One of the things mm -hmm. that I'm probably going to put on their treatment plan is, um, you know, develop some coping skills to help them get through the day um, so that they're hopefully not as miserable at work. Uh, and then also try to do some problem solving around whether or not they do want to leave this position or find another job, right? You and your therapist should review a treatment plan every so often. It should be a living document because as you continue to achieve some of those things, uh, it's going to continue to change. That should be how it goes, right? Now, mm -hmm. after that first session, your other session should be informed by your treatment plan. Um, so I'm always going to ask my clients when they come in, how are you doing? How has your mood been since the last time I saw you, right? And then we're going to say, okay, well, one of the major goals that we had was to decrease the number of panic attacks that you're having, right? That's a common one that I'll work on folks with. And so um, maybe we'll talk through, tell me a little bit about what's bringing on these panic attacks. Do you notice that there's a particular situation that you're in? We're going to talk through a little bit of that. And then we're going to do some coping skills. Well, here's some things you can do to help you when you're having a panic attack. We're also going to try to identify, I know it feels like you go from zero to 100, but your body's sending you some clues before you're actually mm -hmm. in a full-blown panic attack. So let's figure out what those look like, because if you uh, can figure that out, then we can hopefully shut it down before you're like, you know, in the middle of a Walmart uh, and mm -hmm. somebody's calling 911 for you, right? So the sessions after that should really revolve around whatever your treatment plan goals are. And it's going to look slightly different depending on your therapist. And this is why it's so important to find a therapist that specializes in what it is that you're looking to get help with. So I can't be everybody's therapist. Um, I do not work with folks who are actively struggling with substance abuse. I do not have training in being able to help folks who are struggling with eating disorders. I do not work with couples, right, as just some examples. I haven't had specialized extra trainings in being able to help folks that are coming to me with those kinds of issues. And if you do a little bit of research ahead of time, 
you should be able to Google your therapist um, and find their therapy den profile or their psychology today profile or their website. And somewhere mm -hmm. online, it should have listed, these are the populations that I specialize in working with. It's so important that you do that work ahead of time because it's going to save you some frustration later on down the line. Because if I have somebody coming to me telling me that they are, um, you know, actively using whatever substance it is, I'm going to say to them, okay, well, I know some fantastic therapists who do work primarily with folks struggling with substance use, and I'm going to give you a referral to one of them because it's just not my area of expertise. And it's not mm -hmm. fair to that client that I try to help them with that thing, right? So mm -hmm. um, whatever your therapist specializes in, they are going to have different techniques and modalities that they use to help you with that particular issue. In my instance, um, being a certified clinical trauma professional, I work with a lot of folks that have a fairly extensive history of trauma. And so I rely upon my trauma training to be able to help those folks understand how did your past trauma affect you and continues to impact your behavior present day? And then what are some coping skills you can put in place so that you're recognizing when it's your past trauma kind of rearing its head. And then mm -hmm. also so that you are living life um, according to the person that you want to be and not the person that it feels like your trauma is kind of forcing you to be, which is how a lot of my clients come to me in the very beginning. So um, there's so, I mean, my field is alphabet soup. There's ACT, <laughs> there's DBT, there's CBT, there's EMDR, there's yeah. all kinds of things. Um, I don't even know what some of that alphabet mm. soup means. But if you do some research, you can find a therapist that specializes in um, what it is that you're struggling with. And if you're not entirely sure, you, the therapist that you have scheduled an appointment with should have a network of therapists that they know that they can help connect you to. So I have colleagues that specialize in working with eating disorders. I have colleagues that specialize in working with couples, and I am happy to provide a referral to you because I've developed that professional network because I know I can't be everybody's therapist. Right. Um, so once we've started therapy, how do we know if our therapist is a good fit for us? That's a great one. I think the first, the first um, clue is that you feel comfortable. You should feel like, okay, this feels like a safe place for me to be. I feel like I can tell my therapist about the affair and they're not going to judge me for it. I can process through what it is. So you should feel comfortable talking to your therapist, especially about those things that you have been um, too ashamed or too guilty about to bring up to your friends. That may not happen in the first section, session. That may not happen in the second session. Um, it usually takes a little bit of time. You know, sometimes I'm in session number four or five with somebody and then they're like, oh, by the way, you know, and, and it's this big thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, thank you for letting me know. And I get it because they're kind of testing the waters, right? They want to see, um, do I really want to tell Natasha about, uh, in, in my case, it's almost always past trauma, um, you know, about this thing that happened to me when I was five, right? You should feel comfortable talking to your therapist. If you find that you are kind of dreading your therapy appointments and you're like, oh, I don't really want to talk to them. And, you know, it's, it's that discomfort. Mm -hmm. That's a sign that it may not be the best fit for you. You should never feel judged by your therapist. Um, you know, if you tell your therapist about like a previous suicide attempt or something like that, you should feel heard and supported and validated. Um, you should not feel judged for, for things that you're sharing with your therapist. It's another good reason to do research again into what is it that your therapist specializes in. Sometimes it doesn't feel like a good fit because they just don't have the training in whatever it is that they're coming to you with, right? Sometimes also it's very helpful to find a therapist that shares an identity with you. So for example, um, I'm first generation American. My parents are immigrants to this country. That very much influences my worldview and is a huge part of who I am. 
And I really like working with clients who are also first generation American because we have that shared identity and I kind of get that about them, right? And so there may mm -hmm. be, um, you know, you may have a gender preference for a therapist that you see. There may be a religious preference for a therapist that you want to see. Um, there may be, you know, there, there are therapists who are trans, there are therapists who are gay, there are therapists who are non-binary. You may want to share that kind of identity with your therapist and that makes absolute sense right um mm -hmm. sometimes it's a um like a race or ethnic identity right um you know i one of my colleagues lives up in dc and she is one of the very few uh desi counselors in her area and so and, and she's muslim and so mm. she has a wait list for folks at this point um because it's people want to see her, right? That's a, that's a shared identity that they have. So think about those things. Oftentimes those are also going to help you find a good fit as well. And the other thing is it should feel like it's helping, right? Mm -hmm. You may not be able to pinpoint, oh, it was in session three and, you know, the skies opened up and I had this mm -hmm. epiphany. Um, every so often that does happen, but more often what I see is over time, people feel more confident or they have gained insight into their behavior or they're able to do some good boundary setting where they weren't able to do boundary setting before. Um, or maybe they were able to make that decision. You know, I kind of made up a client earlier who came to me and was debating whether or not they want to leave that job, right? Well, they've come to a decision and they feel good about the decision that they've made, right? Um, so it should feel like you're making progress. Now, some sessions are harder than others. If I have done a session with somebody where we have processed one of the most traumatic things that happened in their childhood, you're probably going to walk away from that session feeling exhausted mm -hmm. and cried out and like I poked at a really raw wound, right? And you may feel that way for a day or two. But after that, it should start to feel better. It should start to feel like, oh, wow, it doesn't feel as heavy now. I was able to release that. I was able to get it out there. So you're going to have difficult sessions. Um, that's part of the progress, right, is, mm -hmm. is we're finally confronting these things that we've kept inside us for so long. But overall, you should be tracking towards, I feel better. I have a higher quality of life. I feel like I'm becoming the person that I want to be. Um, you know, I'm functioning better in my relationship or, uh, I'm a better parent to my kids, right? Whatever that looks like for you. So those are some general ideas about whether or not therapy is working for you. Okay. So therapy is working great. Let's say, how long do we need to be in therapy? Uh, I wish I had an answer to that question. Right. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It very much depends on your situation. And it very much depends on the work that you and your therapist are doing together. Um, if I have somebody coming to me because they all of a sudden have developed this fear of public speaking, um, but their job requires them to do a lot of presentations, we may be able to resolve that in under 10 sessions. You know, if I have somebody coming to me who was abused from the ages of five to 15 and then have had, you know, got into two relationships where there was domestic abuse, they're probably going to need to be in therapy for a significant, significantly longer period of time, right? So it very much depends on what you're going into therapy for. The other thing to keep in mind is this. If you are starting with those EAP sessions, you're going to have a limited number of sessions. One of the conversations to have with that EAP therapist is, okay, so my employer only gives me four of these sessions. What do I do when those four sessions are over? Sometimes mm -hmm. you're able to continue on with that EAP therapist. Sometimes they need to refer you out to somebody else. The same thing goes for your commercial health insurance. When you're checking um, to see who is in network in your area, the other thing that you should be checking is how many sessions are you allowed? Okay. Um, 
Unfortunately, we are in a system where insurance companies very much dictate what we can and can't do. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes um, people are allowed 12 sessions a year. Sometimes you can get unlimited sessions, but there's a $50 copay every time you go to see your therapist. Um, I've had folks that have used a flexible spending account or a health savings account, and you can pay for therapy that way. Um, so sometimes you're limited based on the bureaucracy of right. the system in, in which we are here in the United States, unfortunately. But it really very much depends on your presenting issue and um, where you're tracking on those goals that you set up with your therapist in that initial appointment. Yeah. Yeah, the um, the therapist, the talk therapist that I'm seeing now, I like what she said, and I think it was my first session. She said, because we were talking about progress, and that's how sure. you know therapy's working. Yep. And she said, my job is for you to put me out of a job where yes. we get to a point where you don't even need me anymore, right? Absolutely, so, yes. So I appreciated that because it, it felt like she wasn't going to try to keep me there forever. She was actually yeah. going to try to help yeah. me and, and get yes. that progress going. And that's always what we're hoping for. I always want to get to the point where my clients don't need to see me anymore. It's a weird job to be in because my job is to put myself out of a job, right? Right. Um, And, you know, it is bittersweet for us. Like, I'm always, like, really excited and then also a little bit sad when um, a client is like, you know... I, I think that I'm ready to go out and live my life. And I'm like, yes, go out and live <laughs> your life. Um, and then, you know, we always wonder how you're doing and we hope that you're doing well and um, that you're succeeding and that kind of thing. But yes, absolutely. We are trying to put ourselves out of a job. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're hopefully getting to the point where um, you're using your coping skills, you're recognizing patterns of behavior, and you're just feeling better overall, right? So that's another good way of um, kind of gauging how long it will take because um, typically you'll start out with one session a week. Mm-hmm. And then as you start to process things, as you learn these coping skills, you drop down frequency. And so um, I have a couple of clients right now that we're checking in with each other about once a month. And mm-hmm. I may do that for a couple of months. And then it's like, all right, I think you're probably good to, you know, go out and live your life. Awesome. I love that. That is kind of a, a weird, a weird job that you have <laughs> to put yourself out of a job. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so where can, where can we get more information about you and about what you do? Sure. So right now I work for Headspace Health. Um, If you've heard of Headspace, the meditation app, Mm -hmm. I'm on the behavioral health side of the house. So uh, I don't have my own private practice. Um, I am licensed to see folks in the states of Florida, Washington, and Oregon. And so if you get Headspace Health or Ginger as a um, benefit through your employer, then you would be able to request me by name. I'm in their data bank of therapists. Um, But also I do have a LinkedIn account. Um, And so if folks are interested in having me speak to an organization, I do a lot of talks on compassion fatigue, on burnout, destigmatizing mental health care, Mm -hmm. um, and those kinds of things. You know, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, My email address is my name. It's natashadarkangelo at gmail.com. Uh, that is not a HIPAA protected email. So please do not send me um, Mm -hmm. any like super private information. Uh, You know, if it's, hey, you know, I have an organization would like to have you come out and speak by all means. Um, But just don't send me like any private information on that email address. So awesome. And I hope you, you have destigmatized, you know, therapy for a lot of people. Because I know, you know, like my mom doesn't know I go to therapy because of the stigma there, you know, sure. she's from that generation. So that's mm-hmm. something that, that I keep from her, but you know, my daughter knows I go to therapy because I'm trying to destigmatize that. Yes. Right? And we should be normalizing it for our kids. You know, it's the way that I look at it is this, if you had a friend that came to you, right. And they said to you, man, you know, I went to the gym last week and my foot's just really bothering me. It's, you know, it's black and blue and I can't really put mm. any weight on it. And, uh, it just hurts all the time you would not look at that friend and say to them, you know, that's probably all in your head. I think that you should just get over it, right? And yet we do that all the time with folks on their mental health. What if, if you had a friend coming to you saying, I'm really struggling right now, 
Things are not going well at work. It feels like my relationship is falling apart. Uh, I'm sad most days and I, I, and I'm really forcing myself to get out of bed. What if you said to that friend, wow, I'm so sorry to hear that. I think that you probably need to talk to a professional and I would be happy to help you find somebody, right? Um, Every single statistic that I've ever come across with research in the field of suicide has said, all people need is one person in their lives to genuinely check in with them and Mm -hmm. ask them how they're doing to prevent the suicide. Wow. It only takes one person, one person, and you could be that person for somebody else. And that's a pretty powerful thing, right? That's another thing that we don't often talk about. We are scared to use the word suicide because we think somehow that if we use the word suicide, we're like putting that idea in somebody's head. You're not. I guarantee you, you're not. If they're thinking about suicide, that happened long before you ever mentioned that word to them, right? Mm. And so think about normalizing these conversations with your friend. Have you thought about talking to a professional about that? My field exists for a reason, right? right. The other thing is every single, every single statistic coming out of uh, the COVID era shows that the, the numbers for folks struggling with anxiety have gone up, I think, threefold. The number of folks struggling with depression have gone up at least doubly, depending on, I've, I've looked at the American Psychiatric Association, the Kaiser Family Foundation, and uh, the CDC has the National uh, Center for Health Statistics. Every single one of them says that as a nation, we are more anxious and more depressed. And so if you're struggling right now, that's pretty normal. There are people like me that are willing, ready and able to help you with this, right? Right. So, um, and then the other thing that I would, I feel like we need to start celebrating it. You know, if somebody's going to therapy, wow, I'm really Mm -hmm. proud of you for taking that step to take care of yourself. Um, If somebody is taking an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication, you would never tell somebody who's diabetic not to take their insulin, right? You wouldn't make Mm -hmm. fun of them for that. And so let's not do that for people who are taking mental health medicine either. You know, a lot of times um, folks suffer in silence because they Mm -hmm. don't want the people around them to know. Sometimes it is a generational thing. Sometimes it's a cultural thing. Sometimes it's a combination of both. Um, I mean, I'm a therapist and I have a therapist. She's fantastic. (laughs) I saw her last week, right? Um, you, You should have a therapist. It's just like how you don't get an oil change when your car is like broken down on the side of the road. It's kind of a maintenance Mm -hmm. thing, right? Your brain is also an organ Mm -hmm. and it's okay for you to be going to somebody to take care of that part of you. It's one of the best things you can do for yourself. And if you're a parent, you're going to become a better parent as a result. I can guarantee you that. Absolutely. And I really enjoy going to therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, because you really can't just go and say everything and so much comes out of it I've had so many revelations yes you know especially during um, EMDR you know type of of yeah therapy for use for use for trauma I've learned so much about myself from that it's it's been incredible Absolutely. absolutely so thank you so much for coming on hope Thank everybody you enjoyed me. it. Um, you can find me at itherstomom.com and at itherstomom on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'd also love to hear from you via email at itherstomom at gmail.com. I wish everybody a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Thanks. Thank you.